to make it. They must not know I love trips to Vegas. The underdog became the underrated. In my city, I'm paraded. Confetti dropping when I'm home. I'm floating down Tudor. Floating on strong. Had so many rights, they couldn't tell us we was wrong. The Martin Miller School, we was on. I got this lion heart in my chest. I'm one of the best. They ask about him. They gon' bring up success. See, I've been fighting this stress. You ain't right, you get left. I'm good with my left, so I don't argue with rest. Cause just like EA, I'm in the game. Hey everybody, it's Rob and K. Rich here. We're here with Misa, our expert, the mistress of all mathematics <laughs> and, and and all the vocabulary that we were going to need today. So what did you just say is our topic today? Because there are lots of vocabulary and vernacular, and I'm just trying to try to pop in a whole bunch of different words here, like synonyms and, and, and things like that, that you have to understand when you're doing business. And if you don't have these words down, you're going to sound like you don't know what you're doing, one. <laughs> Two, you're going to be missing out on stuff because, once, if you don't know what the word is, you probably don't know what it does for your business. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those big things. And we're not going to be talking about, you know, a whole bunch of little acronyms, you know, like three-letter words for things. We're actually <laughs> going to be talking about actual words that are actually impactful in your business. Yes. Now, um, one of the big things here is that once you have these down and you start implementing them in your business and you understand how to use them correctly, mm -hmm. as Misa will explain, then you're going to see growth. You're going to see lots of people that are not going to have, you know, or your, well, your books are going to look nicer. <laughs> your, your business is going to run smoother. And uh, I mean, even from my experience, I'm pretty sure, Carrie's going to say the same thing, is that once we understood the differences from some of these words and stuff like that, then uh, we could actually understand our, our company better, right? Wow, we got comments already. Who's got it? Is that you, Carrie? <laughs> oh, vocab matters. That's right. Sean, Sean jumping in there. Hey, Sean. Right. Um, yeah, vocab definitely does matter, and sometimes I get tongue-tied, but hey, that's life, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. Carrie, you got anything to say today before we start off here? Or? Yeah, I mean, number one, first off, Misa, thank you for showing back mm -hmm. up and providing so much value for us each week. I've got my pen and paper ready, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's change up here. Okay, so let's start with our first one. Now, um, once again, you know, Misa's from Perfectly Kept Books. Uh, you can go to perfectlykeptbooks.com and you can actually uh, – get in there and uh, she can help you out. Uh, if you have any questions, she's more than happy to help you. And of course, well, if you want to do business with her, she's more than happy to do that too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at this one first one. The first one is cash versus a cure. Yes, yes, yes. So these are the two accounting methods that any business can choose from. And particularly small businesses, this is important because most small businesses are fine using the cash method because the cash method, you only record your sales or purchases when cash changes hands. So all, you're not worried about, oh, if I invoice somebody or if I have this bill, it doesn't matter. If no cash has changed hands, you're not worried about it. And so for usually for small businesses, this method works better because they can actually see the money coming in and out versus the accrual method where you are actually record the sales and purchases are recorded when when they actually happen. So if you invoice someone today, you're, you're saying I got the sale, even though you may not get paid until months later. So for you, you're like, oh, well, I just invoiced and I'm I'm going to get paid but it doesn't really help you if you don't have that money in your bank. And so for smaller businesses, the cash method benefits them because when it comes to tax time, you're, ta you're, you're taxed based on the profit that you made. So if you invoice some people and they haven't paid you, you're gonna be paying tax on money that you haven't even earned yet. So of course, every situation is different, but usually for a smaller business, 
the cash method is usually the way to go for them because one, it makes more sense because it's pretty simple. It's you, not too much tracking and figuring out, oh, I need to collect this and I need to do this. It's straightforward. Accrual, now you start making a bunch of money and you, you know, you really getting up there. Yeah, you might actually have to you might actually have to switch to accrual. And that's a good thing because if you're making a lot of money, that means you're doing really, really, really well. And so those that's just at a basic level. It's just the timing of when your sales and purchases are recorded. And so for smaller businesses, usually you don't have to pay too much attention to accrual and the cash works just fine because it's when is the cash changing hands? Yeah. And I think one of the big things here is, is as, as I've always said, is like basically if what I'm dealing with small businesses or, or small you know, individuals themselves, cash is, mm -hmm. cash is king. But when I start dealing with corporate stuff, um, mm -hmm. definitely, definitely a cure is the way to go. Uh, because that's how they work. They have, you know, people that they have to report to bookkeepers. They have mm -hmm. and people who sign the checks and get them out the door. <laughs> yes. But when you do a cure, you need to have your dates down. You mm -hmm. have to know when people are supposed to be sending you money. You have to track that and you have to be very diligent. And sometimes I hate to say it, sometimes you got to be forceful about it. Like, Hey guys, yes. like you're supposed to pay this. It hasn't been paid you know um so always remember to you know keep a smile you know be polite be friendly about it but uh if they haven't paid you for the first job don't let them have a second job you know yes, exactly <laughs> exactly yeah, especially when it's like thousands of dollars or something like that right exactly so, yeah okay so the next one we got is of course accounts receivable and accounts payable and i always get it <laughs> backwards and, and but i i know the difference but whenever i say them i get them all messed up so yeah so so accounts receivable is just who owes you money and so it's important to know if you've invoiced somebody or you're expecting payment from somebody you need to know who it is and you know you need to know when they're supposed to pay you so that you get paid on time and you're not chasing them for money later and then on the other side Accounts payable is money that you owe to others. So if someone sends you sends you a bill and they're like, "Hey, you need to pay us by this date," then you so you then you're on the other side of it, and you need to make sure you're paying people on time. And these go together because when you're trying to manage your cash and watch your cash flow, you have to really, really pay attention to okay, when am I expecting money to come in? And when am I also expecting to pay a bill? Because if you have more AP than you have AR, that's not good. Because that means you won't, be able to, you won't be able to pay your bills. And if you can't pay your bills, you're gonna have some not so happy vendors because they're gonna be like, where's my money? And that, of course, that can just cause all kinds of problems later down the line. Because if, for instance, if you don't pay a bill that you owe to a vendor and they're waiting on payment before they either send you something or they give you something that you need in order to perform a service or create a product, you'll be in trouble because then you can't even run your business. So usually smaller businesses don't have too much AR and AP to worry about. Again, cause it's like going back their cash. So it's like, usually they're getting cash, you know, right, you know, right up front or they're paying the bills right away. So it's not, really an issue, but it does become an issue if you do ever have to invoice somebody. Even if it's just one person, you, you're still going to have to make sure they pay it because there's no, no guarantee that anybody's going to pay anything. So like, you can invoice them all day, but who, who's to say, oh yes, they're going to pay me. It's you, you have to, you're going to have to hound some people sometimes if they don't pay it by the due date. So that's yeah. very important. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, and that's and that's one of those things. Like the curable goes into like accounts receivable, and you know, um, I always get them mixed up because people pay you 
on the receivable and you have to pay <laughs> people when you receive a bill. And that's why I always get them mixed up. So uh, I know it sounds really stupid, but I always thought about like, R, I'm a pirate and where be my money? So I always remember accounts are receivable, A, R, R. And then like AP is like, apply this money to the bills, right? So like just kind of a big goes. Um, that's just how Rob thinks. Um, People always understand me, but you know, if you use that principle, then uh, you'll you'll probably understand. R, where's my money? Is receiving, right? Get your money in and apply that money to your bills, right? That's AP. Yeah, I've, never, I've actually never heard it like explained that way, and that's actually a good definition. Because <laughs> I, I like I was always getting confused when I was in the big company, uh, and they were like, "Well, you got to send the bill over to the uh, or like." You gotta get accounts receivable yes. to pay the bills or get the money, get paid or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, yep. so <laughs> it works that way. All right, so uh, yeah. So next one is, of course, one that a lot of us know, but yes. is very important to track, of course. Yes, expenses. expenses. So all the stuff you're spending money on, those are all your expenses. And just, just the opposite of that is, all the money you're bringing in, that's your income. So you want to make sure, one, you want to track your expenses to see, one, are they expenses that you even need? Because I know a lot of times you can get out here and you're just like, oh, there's a new software. There's a new something here. Oh, I see somebody bought that. Oh, there's a new course. And it's just like, oh, let me just spin, spin, spin. But then it's like, did you really need to spend? Or are you spending on things that, you're probably not even paying attention to like software, the subscriptions, you know, oh yeah, you can sign up for that free trial and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, I'll try it out. And then you don't cancel it. And then they keep charging you. And then, then like, it's a year later, you're like, I've been charged a whole year's worth of, you know, for this <laughs> software that I'm not even using. And it's because you, you didn't even notice because you weren't really paying attention. You just let them charge it. And, like I'm very, very meticulous about expenses, and I'm like, if I, I'm like, oh no, not using that. Let's cancel, <laughs> or, or wait, did I, you know, really thinking about, do I need to spend this today, and is it gonna, you know, benefit me in some way, especially if it's a really, really large purchase, where it's like, okay, so, because I know, for instance, advertising and marketing, that's a big, big expense most businesses incur. But then it's like, if you're putting the money into it, is it actually giving you a return? Because it's like, okay, are you you spending all this money on ads and marketing and all this other stuff? But I'm like, is it generating leads? Are you getting clients? Are you earning any revenue from it? Because then when, when you start to is look at your- Is it a tax business, right off? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because then it's like, well, I'm spending all this money, but what like what's the purpose at the end? It's like it needs to be able to generate money at some point because that's the whole goal of the business is to generate money. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And one of the funny one of the funny things I'm just gonna say here, it's just a story I actually heard yesterday was um, Gary Vanderchuk, if you know who he is, he's a big marketer mm -hmm. guy and stuff like that, right? Um, he was talking to his bookkeeper, and the bookkeeper was like, "Oh my God, we're gonna have this huge tax bill. We need some sort of write-off, uh, uh -huh. you know, to like get rid of this." So um, he he picked up the phone and he called a sales guy, and the sales guy was for Learjet <laughs> or <laughs> some some jet company. He goes, "I want to buy a jet. Can you get me one?" And they're like, well, you know, we're booked back and stuff like that. And he goes, okay, give me a couple of minutes. I'll, 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 I need to talk to someone. So he gets off the phone with that. And he calls his bookkeeper and he goes, send Lear or whoever the company was, like such and such an amount of money. And to send it to them. And then he gets on the phone. And he goes, um, you might want to call, you know, he calls back the sales guy. You might want to reach over to your accounting receivable. And and see, uh, you know, there's there should be some money there. I need I need this jet right now. And the guy's like, "We'll see what we can do." Exactly. <laughs> and it was like, "Oh, right." And he wrote the whole jet off because he was going to be using it for business, right? So it was mm -hmm. like, I was like, "Ooh, easy expense," but 
okay, if you can justify it, I'm pretty sure the IRS will be okay with it. Wink, wink. And, you know? well, and, that, but that, and that's the thing. I'm like, all your expenses, like really at the end of the day, it's can you justify it? Because if they were to ever audit you and they say, what is this expense? Can you back it up? You just need to be able to back it up. And for every person and every business, it can be different because someone with a photography business they don't have the same type of expenses as someone who has maybe a brick and mortar store. So it's like, they're going to have different types of expenses and their expenses will make sense for their particular type of business and industry. So that's always yeah. something to consider. <laughs> so just a side note, if you're a photographer and you need a write off, go <laughs> buy that nice Canon, like, you know, yes! Eight yes! Million, you know like $30,000 lens for your <laughs> digital camera. It's a write off. <laughs> it then rent sense. it out then rent it out when you're not using it right? and then it becomes another income revenue there you go <laughs> value today for you photographers <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right yeah, expenses definitely and always keeping an eye on them um, mm -hmm. and keeping your receipts is a big thing because I know as a bookkeeper you want to see those receipts and uh you know, mm -hmm. have them itemized in detail, but also like put a note. Like I, I would write on the back of my receipts, like what it was for, because mm -hmm. when you just grab a receipt, like I, this is a receipt from earlier today. I haven't done it today. I mean, it's all in Korean. I mean, <laughs> most people would never understand what's going on, but right. um, if I, if I go to like a Canadian tax person, then like the, the revenue service goes like, what's this receipt? I'll be like, uh, well, I can read it. They can't read it. So I have to like write on the back, you know, like, oh, this is like food for a business meeting or something like that. You know? mm -hmm. um, this way you can also, your bookkeeper can also put those expenses into the right yes. category. Yes. Right? And that's, and that's a huge thing because then you can track what you're spending your money on and what yes. you shouldn't be spending your money on. Mm -hmm. Like steak dinners with your five-year-olds. <laughs> Sorry, shot there, Lou. Man, old business partner did that. I was like, that's not a write off. <laughs> oh, all funny. right. So let's look at the next one here, right? Okay. So this one's actually a new one to me, but I think I know what it is. But I'm not quite sure, but I think I know. I think it's like a a ledger of like who your people are that you pay you money. <laughs> so chart of accounts. Well, like well, close? your chart of accounts. It's the it's the names and the type of accounts that you assign for your business, so that you know how to record your transactions. Uh, so this is this is like very 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 important because if you're setting up an accounting software, this is the first thing that you need to do because if you don't have your category set up, there's nothing. There's no way you can categorize anything. And a lot of times people are like, well, what categories can I use or what should I choose? And I don't know what goes where. Well, to start, the IRS can help a little bit because you can look at like the, the Schedule C form and look at what categories they have. And then right. you can kind of just it gives you a starting place because they have their definitions of what this means and what would belong here. And then you kind of take that as your starting point and then just modify it for your business. So you might have office expenses. Anything could go into office expenses. Like really anything could. But then if you want to potato chips. <laughs> exactly. The basket of potato chips and a basket <laughs> yeah. of little snacks at the end of that's an office expense. Exactly. No, but and it could be. And that's the thing. But it's like you because you can you could just have a general category like that, you know, office expense, but then you could also have a subcategory like office stacks, you know, just so you can, you can actually clearly see specifically what you're spending your money on. But then just as long as you have the really at the end of the day, as long as you know, which categories you're going to need to give to your tax accountant so that they can file your taxes. That's all that matters. So if you can, if you can keep it simple. Account, enough, okay, so, so basically the chart of accounts is just the different categories that you are putting your expenses in. Okay, so that makes a lot more sense. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, 
<laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's the thing. Like, we're we're here to learn that vocabulary and learn how we can apply it and, and where we can put it. So yeah, chart of a chart of accounts. Uh, mm -hmm. Carrie, we don't have a chart of accounts. It's a, it's like your <laughs> credit card or my credit card, right? So <laughs> gotta fix that. So. <laughs> So, uh, Misa's gonna do it like hit us when she sees us or something like that. So, yes. well, that's no, you need you need you need to have it set up. Uh, next one here, okay. So, next one is uh, financial statements, okay. So, this is a big one, of course. Yes, this one is huge because this is this tells you how your business is doing. You have three main, like there are multiple financial statements, but there are three main ones, especially for smaller businesses that they should be looking at every month. And I, and I do say every month because you do want to look at them every month, but you have your income statement or P&L, which of course tells you how much money you've made, how much money you've spent, and if you have a profit or not. Just That's pretty much cut and dry. You have your balance sheet, which tells you your assets, your liabilities, and your equity. So your assets, what what you own, your liabilities, what you owe, and then your equity. So your, your stake in the company, how much of the company belongs to you as far as money you've put in, money you've taken out, all that great stuff. And then one of the most important financial statements that people probably don't even think about is the statement of cash flow, which tells you how your cash is moving and how much cash you have on hand. And what I love about the reports and about accounting is that all the accounts connect and they, they should match. So there's there, you should be able to match all of your reports together. And that's how you know one that you've done it right. And that you're working with accurate data. If you, if you can't tie your reports together, there's probably something wrong and you probably want to get some help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And one of the big things about this is like, it's kind of like, you know, like when you go into the hospital and you got like that, you know, the line that goes beep, 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 mm -hmm. beep, you know, it's the lifeline. The financial statements is that lifeline mm -hmm. where like you can see the ups and downs and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, you don't want it to go pew, you know, like <laughs> because as you go down, it's hard to get back up, right? Um, but I do have a question here. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they start off their businesses, like, I don't know, uh, either Canada or United States, like when we say sweat equity, right? It's mm -hmm. like what you're putting in time to that business. Is there a way for people to actually add that kind of like some sort of statement in there for like <laughs> saying, like, I've spent this much time. So this is like how much I own of the business based on how much sweat equity I put in? Well, not necessarily. I mean, you, because depending on how the business is formed, if so, if it's just you, like it's all yours. So it's going to be a hundred percent. I own it because it's just me. You have partners. Right. Then of course, you know, it's equally split or depending on how, you know, you want to split it. But the, yeah, the like all any upfront work, there's not really a way to kind of if it's not if it's not financial so if it's like there's no money spent it's kind of hard to track any of the right. like your you know you know that upfront work you've yeah. done without putting, you know you haven't put any money yeah. down yet so it's yeah it's more it's, it's it's more so i think for those people who have like a business partner who one business partner has the money and mm. the other business partner doesn't have the money but has the knowledge mm -hmm. right and like, how do people equate that? So like, would that be like some sort of contractual agreement? Well, yes. you know, well, you put it in like someone has it. like this much money, cash value, yeah. and this person's putting in this much time, which would be equivalent cash value. Especially for partnerships, you did, because there yeah. should be a partnership agreement as far as how, how you're going to operate this business. So even if this person is just putting in money and they're not doing like any of the work, it should all be outlined in your agreement. So that's something that you and your partner decide up front. This is how we're going to operate. You know, I, I don't own any more than you just because I'm putting up money. It's like we're going to be equal partners because, yes, you're putting up money, but I'm putting in like all this work. So it, it's, it's, it's however you outline it in your partnership agreement. So, 
yeah, definitely if you have a partnership, you definitely want to make sure you have an agreement in place to outline how you're going to operate your business. Right. Yeah. So would you like, I was sorry, Rob, to interrupt. Okay. Um, just like an, a real life example um, is me creating a private placement memorandum, um, which was an investment tool that allowed me and my business um, to, 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 to really earn and, and, and grow our capital. Um, and in that moment, that's what we had to do. We had to come up with an agreement. And in that calculation, if you're working with a lawyer and you're building out a private placement mm -hmm. memorandum and you're trying to raise capital uh, for your business, um, it actually, you can build that into your private placement memorandum. You can build that into your contractual agreement with your partner and that that sweat equity can be quantified with a with a calculation um, based off of the percentage that you might want to give a partner so if i do have the sweat equity and i do have the knowledge but i don't have the money then maybe the money is worth 40 percent my knowledge is worth mm -hmm. 60. so that's just something you would have to work out with your lawyer mm -hmm. and and that's like so so important for people who want to go in business with a partner because if you don't have an agreement, yeah, it's going to be better. Hard. You better have an agreement and you better have an agreement that's drafted up from a third party, like yes. a lawyer. Yes. Um, that, that way it's like very clear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I was just wondering about that on a financial statement, like where would you put that? So, yeah. But if it's not something you put in, you can just have that in your partnership agreement, then only the cash value actually goes on the financial statement that's mm -hmm. fine yeah well we don't want to be having to pay I, I pay taxes on sweat equity that'd be something right? <laughs> <laughs> i work 45 hours and you owe 3, <laughs> yeah. that would suck. All right. so let's hop over to the next one okay so the next one is Revenue versus profit. Oh, uh, this this one this this is a big one for me because like you always see those people out there. They're like, oh yes, you know, I have a six figure business and I'm doing this and I I'm earning all this money and then you're just kind of like, okay, but is that your revenue or is that your profit? Because those are two different numbers. Your revenue, that's your top line number, which tells you, okay, this is how much money I've brought in. So I earned this amount of money, but then it doesn't take into effect, in, into account anything that has been deducted out of that money that you've earned. So all your expenses, any cost, that comes out of your revenue first, and then you land at your bottom line, which will be either your profit or your loss if you <laughs> overspend. So it's like, like really being very clear about how you're distinguishing those numbers and not just, especially not just listening to what people say as far as, Oh yeah, I earned this amount of money. And I'm like, did you really? Or <laughs> like, did you really? Because just because you brought in, you know, a certain amount doesn't mean that's what you actually profited. And so it's like, it's, very, very important to pay attention to that bottom line, which is why you always hear that term all the time. It's like, you know, companies are just looking at their bottom line and it's like, because that's the number that matters. And that's yeah. the number you're paying taxes on. So it's that, that's the most, like both numbers are important, but that bottom line is what's really important because it's telling you if you're actually profitable. Because if you don't have any money left over, you're not making any profit. I think that's one of the big things that, you know, like you're going to have to pay taxes on that stuff. It's, it's, it's one of the benefits of being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. or being a, like a solopreneur, um, you know, where you can actually write off part of your house. You can write off a part of your, your, you know, gas, your computer, your, whatever your equipment is. Mm -hmm. Now every country is a little different, of course. Um, yes. But even if you're working remotely, sometimes working for a company could be actually detrimental in comparison to having them pay you as a contractor. Because as a contractor, you can still get life insurance and all that stuff, but you can write off a lot of it as well. Yep. So uh, that's a that's a big thing for a lot of people out there. If you're if you're working and you're a contractor, go get yourself an LLC. And then just start writing stuff off. 
I mean, you can pay your kids. I think uh, I was talking to one of our our, our uh, uh, co-workers yesterday. Um, mm-hmm. and she was actually saying, yeah, you can act in the States. You can actually pay your children up to $12,000 in wages before mm-hmm. they actually have to start paying tax. But it's a write-off to you because it's considered an expense. Mm-hmm. So you can actually write that stuff off. And, and then I countered with, well, if you have a credit card, you should actually put your kids' names on the credit card. So as long as you're paying it off, that's that's the other right. provider. Like you want to be paying it off. So when your kids hit 18, 19, and they're about to go out and get their first, you know, their school loans or whatever, they already have a perfect credit score. Yep, that's true. Not a zero <laughs> credit score. It's a great trick, a great hack. So uh, if you're out there, set yourself up as an LLC, start writing your stuff off, pay your kids, it's a tax write off to you, and mm-hmm. you get to keep your kids' money anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just taking care of it. I'm well, just I mean, managing or, it I mean, for you. You can, or you can look at it as a way to, you know, start them a little savings or something. You know, you can have right, something going right. for them so that by the time they do reach 18, hey, they have some money over here set aside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So revenue and profit is it's so it's so true. And a lot of people, when you start off your small business and you're new to it, uh, you, you might take money out of that till. And we've talked about this before. You, you get money in, you're like, wow, I got like $30 you know, in my till from sales today, I'm going to go buy myself a pizza and get, mm-hmm. but that's not really your money. Yeah. That money's for paying your rent and paying for all these things. Like you take your money last. Well, and that, and that's the thing too, is like you, cause you want to see what your profit is because that will determine how much you can in reality pay yourself in reality. If you, if you're like, I want to be able to pay myself $5,000 a month, if you're not even profiting five thousand dollars, it's it's not even feasible. So th- that's why you want to look at okay, how much money am I bringing in? How much is going out, and how much is left? Because I need to figure out: Do I need to make more money so I can, you know, get enough profit to pay myself my desired wage, or what do I need to change? Do I need to stop spending? Whatever it is, so that you can really figure out where you stand with your numbers. So I've always had this misconception. I've always been told you pay yourself first. So can you answer that for me? Well, yeah. Okay. So yes, you do want to pay yourself first. And and so that's, that's, you kind of want to back into it a little bit. So it's like, if you know, okay, my goal is to be able to pay myself, like say you're starting out, you're saying, okay, I just want to be able to pay myself $10,000 my first year. Okay, so you know, so that means at a minimum you need to profit at least ten thousand dollars enough, you know, enough ten thousand dollars that would be enough to pay you. But then you also have to consider taxes too. So it's like I'm gonna need ten thousand plus a little cushion for taxes, and then from there it's like okay, now I need to back into it a little bit. So if I need to pay, so say just for instance, I need thir- I need to profit thirty thousand dollars minimum. So then it's like okay, these are all my expenses. And so you add, then you kind of add it, you know, add those expenses back and then you get to your revenue number. You're like, I need to be bringing in this amount of money at a minimum if I'm trying to reach this $30,000 profit goal. And so it's kind of it's a way to back into it. So then, you know, if I can do this, I will be able to pay myself what I need to. Because a lot of people are like, well, what do I need to pay myself or how can I pay myself? But it's like you need to know what number you need. And so it's like. What do you need for your like? What do you need for yourself? Like, how much? How much do you need to cover your personal expenses? And that's and it, so it all it all ties together. You start with your personal to get a number, and then it's like, okay, now let's let's kind of back into it a little bit to figure out where do now where do I need to? How much money do I need to actually bring in? Right. It's just like what <clears throat> I know why Rob said you pay yourself last. Because, like, when you start running a business, yeah. you're, I need to pay myself first. But then you have to pay for that bill on the lights and the rent. And you got to pay salary at the end of every week. Yes. Like, like what really comes first? Like, you, you come mm-hmm. last, really, in that equation. But what I say when, I, when, I, when I'm saying you have to pay yourself first is you have to figure out, like you were saying, I, that was a really good explanation 
because mm -hmm. you have to know the number that you need to get to to pay mm -hmm. yourself that amount so that you can take care of everything else as well. Exactly. Yeah. So you got to know your own. I'm going to say this really quietly. Budget. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that, that, that's, the, that's the big thing too. Is like because I'm going to say sorry, problems. sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to say this. Perfectly, Capcom <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I'm like, if you don't even know what you need on a personal level, you don't even know where to start. Some people just kind of throw out like arbitrary numbers. They're like, well, I want to be able to earn X amount. And it's like, but is that what you really need to live? Like. You know, like you can, you know, you can get up to the point where like, yeah, I'm earning all, you know, all this extra money. But it's like at a basic level, what do you need in order to survive in your personal life? And that's a, a good starting point. And then from there, you can always say, well, OK, each year I want to be able to increase that. And then you just kind of work towards it gives you a goal to work towards. So you're not just kind of out here just like, oh, just I'll figure it out. <laughs> and that's actually that's something that you actually need to put in your business plan. Mm hmm. Right. And, and this is something that a lot of people make a mistake on is their business plan. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I can pretty much write a business plan in my sleep, you know, other than, you know, getting all the numbers that takes a little bit of time, but you know, yeah. I've done it so many times, but so many people write a business plan for a launch of the business mm -hmm. and project what they could be making in a year. Yeah, <laughs> but they don't actually. It's called a business plan, not a business paper, right? <laughs> it's, it's a plan. It's living, mm -hmm. and it should be kept up, being updated. It should be kept being changed, yeah. and being presented at any time. Because if you don't have your vision, if you don't have that plan of where you're going. Mm -hmm you're going to falter. You're going to start spending money where you're not supposed to be spending it. You're yeah. going to start putting profits in the wrong places. You know, and when we talked about like marketing and ad revenue and stuff like that, so many small brick and mortars, they don't know how to do marketing. So they don't know how to put that money in places. They don't know how the difference between organic versus paid. So if you don't know mm -hmm. that, Carrie and I can help you with that. So yes. we give one chance, right? <laughs> we'll show you how to do it with whatever budget you have. We'll show you how to do it <laughs> um, and go from there. But keep that business plan as a living, living document and keep updating it. Keep putting your plans in. If you come up with a new idea that you want to put in, Put it in there so you can see where your numbers are. Just don't yeah. go out and buy something and run it, run it in. Then you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to be mm -hmm. minus a whole bunch of money at the end of the month. Right? Exactly. Well, and, it's, and, and for me, too, it's just like how long do you want to continue to do that passionate thing that you love doing? You mm -hmm. better work it into your business plan to get the revenue more than the costs that are going out of your business. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right? Like it's a numbers game. Business mm -hmm. is, is a numbers game. You can't stay in business if your revenue is less than your cost. So <laughs> it's just like, that. this is like point number six. It was a big thing for me. It's just like, how can I limit my liabilities and how can I increase my assets, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the revenue streams that I have coming into my business. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the hints I always tell people is that when you're doing your business plan, Plan it like a franchise. Mm. Mm, mm -hmm. Because we all know that if you want your business to grow, the best way to do it is to franchise it and get it out there. You know, mm -hmm. make another, another location, make another place, you know, double yep. up, right? Um, so if you always think about everything you do as a franchise, your planning, your, your, like, your processes for everything within your store so that you can replicate it. Or if somebody says, hey, man, like, I'd like to invest in your business because I see it doing really well, you can go, mm -hmm. here's the book, here's how you do it, and you can pay yep. me a whole bunch of royalties. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and there's another the record screen for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's check out number seven here. Now, this is a good one as well. This is, this is pretty important. So we're going to be talking about cost of goods sold versus the cost of service. So cost of goods sold is pretty straightforward for product businesses because I'm like, you have to create a product. 
So what does it take you to create that product? So all the materials, shipping, whatever goes into you actually creating and manufacturing that product, those are all the, of your cost of goods sold. So what you'll do is you, you earn your revenue. You, so you sell your product, you earn the revenue, but there's some cost involved that come out first. And so then, then it's like, well, that's kind of how you can determine your pricing is how much is it costing me to create this product? And then how much do I want to be able to make you know, what profit do I want to make from each individual sale? So then that helps you kind of price your actual products. But then on the other hand, if you're a service provider, you don't necessarily have too many costs, like direct costs. However, I like to see it as if you have any costs involved that are directly related to having a client. So it's like, it's a cost you're going to have because you have a client you could consider that a cost of service. And it's something to consider too, because then it's like, if I get a new client, I'm gonna have to pay for this. So then that's coming directly out of my revenue. So then it's like, okay, I get a client, I have to pay for this, it's coming out of my revenue. So this is what I'm actually left with. And so then that will kind of help you price your services. So you can still kind of look at it the same way, even though you don't have a physical product that you're creating. So, so in the cost of services, would that be like the like the cost for advertising and marketing? Would, it could would that be. Go in there? It will. It, that might just be a regular expense. It depends on what type of what the cost is exactly. So, if it's because like usually I like to look at it for service providers, like your merchant fees, or like if you pay for certain subscriptions for us. For a client, so like you're getting software for them so that you can, you know, provide your service. I would consider those. Now, if you're doing like some, say, but it might be for a marketing business, maybe you do some type of, you know, marketing on behalf of that client. So that could be a cost of service. So again, it depends so like on. It, so if I was yeah. like paying for like, like a graphic artist to create their logo or something like that. Yes, exactly. And so that way it's, it's not just lumped in with just all your regular expenses. You can actually see what is directly tied to your revenue so that you can, one, make sure you're pricing your stuff well, and then also see, okay, this it's costing me this much to have a client. So, so like how many clients do I need and how can I really make sure that I'm earning the, the amount of money that I need to earn? And, and, and just to put it in like my kindergarten terms, because like when it, like I'm good at math, but when it comes to like accounting and finance, I was like, I hate these classes. I don't know this. Like this vocabulary is, is really good for me. And the way I see it is I hear there's a cost associated with everything. Mm -hmm. And if you can quantify that and you can separate what each thing costs, and it gives you visibility over your business so yes. that you can see where you might need to turn a hose off or on, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. To turn more revenue on. Like, for example, I mean, a practical example is Rob and I at work at ClickFunnels. Uh, you know, part of our responsibility right now is to look through all of our educational material, training material, mm -hmm. and audit everything that we have. And by going through that process, you identify gaps. Mm -hmm. And you, you see the numbers. And if you're tracking those numbers correctly, they're going to lead you to a decision that needs to be made. Right. Yeah. And that's just what I'm hearing is there is a cost associated with everything. Yes. Yeah. I think one of the other things like with Carrie and I, we, I mean, we have scrabblewalls.com as well. Right. And one of the things mm -hmm. is like Carrie has said, well, we got to figure out the money. And, I just went to town because that's what I do. It like I, I'm so I get everything down to the, 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 the minutia of like you know how much it my is my wife like, is very appreciative of you, Rob. I can tell you that because like my wife is like straight accounting lace. She would be a good accountant, um, but she's like Rob's got it broken down. Oh, that's nice. It's like like it was a sheet, like per cost per piece of tape, cost. For you to mm -hmm. stand this, cost for you to paint this, cost for you to this, that, cost of service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that was more so cost of goods because it's actually what is required to acquire the product to the point of sending it and the customer 
getting it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. That would be yeah. the goods cost, like goods sold, like cost of goods sold, right? Yes. And then cost of service would be like um, paying for your car rental or paying for like any rental for uh, like hand machines or like sanders and stuff like that that mm -hmm. we needed for like a client. So yeah. I think I think I got that right, right? Like, well, yeah. 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 <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I got one. I got I got one for this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So this brings us up to number eight. Right. Mm -hmm. So this brings us up to number eight. Let me grab it here. And this is the one that a lot of people get mixed up. Yes. A lot of people get this one mixed up. And I know I, I'm going to put my hand up. I got this one mixed up a lot. <laughs> um, but I, I understood it. I, I finally got it in my head, which one's which. Uh, but some people have a hard time with this one and they get mm -hmm. they confused with stuff. And especially at tax time. Yes. <laughs> people, people get this mixed up all the time. And yeah. it's gross profit. And then like net profit and profit mm -hmm. margins and stuff like that, like gross profit, net profit. Oh man, that confused the hell out of me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and so of course you can look at it. Gross, gross is the top line number. So it's yeah. whatever the beginning, beginning number. And then of course, considering any cost of goods sold or cost of services. And then that gives you your gross profit. So that lets you know, whenever I sold this product or I got this client, I earned this revenue, we took out the cost, and this is my gross profit. So this is before any of my normal business expenses come out. So then it's kind of like, okay, this is what I, I'm left with to pay all my bills and then pay myself. And then when we get to the bottom, we get the net profit, which is the very, very important number because that's what you're going to pay taxes on. And both of these numbers are shown as a percentage. And it's telling you what percentage of income you're actually keeping after any costs and expenses are taken out. So when you look at your gross profit, it's okay, well, I, I earned this amount. We took out those costs and then I have, I have an amount left. And so it's like, what amount is that? And then once you take out all your expenses and you have your net profit and your net profit margin, what percentage is left? And the higher the profit margin, the better because that means you're keeping, you're keeping more, you're, you're keeping money. more money. <laughs> you're keeping money. more money. And if it's lower, you're not keeping as much. And that's usually, you know, those are the businesses that are probably really, really tight. And, you know, they're probably just barely making it. And so they usually have to watch, you know, watch their expenses and everything a little bit closer than, you know, someone else who they might have, you know, an 80, 90% profit margin. So it's not, as, so, so is there a percentage for a business to know if they're healthy or not? Like well, what, what profit margin percentage do I need to be at? Or is it just, does it fluctuate? Like you said, it really, it really depends mm -hmm. on your type of business and what industry you're in. So for instance, if you run a restaurant, restaurants, if you probably look up most restaurants, they probably have a lower <laughs> profit margin because it takes a lot to run a restaurant. That's not, that's not an easy business. And they have a lot of costs and expenses that goes into running the business versus if it's someone like me, a service provider, Mike's, I don't have many expenses and I don't have a lot of costs. So if I, you know, I have the right amount of clients, I can keep pretty much the bulk of the revenue that I earn because I don't have as many expenses. You, so can that's have awesome. a, you can have a lower gross because you don't have as yeah. many expenses going up. Okay. Exactly. So that's, that's kind of how to look at it. It's like, what industry are you in? Because some industries it's just, it's just harder. <laughs> it's just, it's just a harder industry to be in. It's harder to run a business, especially ones where you have a brick and mortar actual place. You have a store, you have a building, because that in and of itself is a huge expense versus people who don't, if you don't have, if you're virtual, you don't have a space or any like, like rent or anything you have to pay. That's a huge expense that you just take off the table right off the top. And so it's like that right there can be 
such a huge determining factor in where you land in your margins. Oh, hell yeah. That was very good advice. That made it very clear for me. Great advice. Yeah. Uh, and then one of the big things is like I had my own store and, you know, we had the storefront, mm -hmm. we had the signs, we had, you have to have a bathroom, you had to have access, you had to yeah. have all these other things and they all add up, you mm -hmm. know, like all those little things. And then you got to pay them all off. Yeah. Um, but one of, one of my crazy analogies is like, you know, gross, gross is basically like a big pile of money and it's kind of like all dirty, <laughs> you know what it is, right? It's like, it's right there that's my gross profit but then like your mm -hmm. net profit is like when you take that that net and you go in there and like you shake it around and like all the little crappies fall out and then you got like the gold nuggets yeah. there, right? the golden fish so that's your net profit you know so you know that's how i read this hey, show, I your, your, show, your images, shirt, I my own images of them. show your shirt rob because that he's a gold oh, digger you know, <laughs> Prospectors. Yeah, it's not a Congress T-shirt. This is actually a ClickFunnels T-shirt, and you know what? Not many people have this one. I do not, and I'm jealous. <laughs> although, although here's a cool, cool story. We're at work. And one of my uh, former bosses, Mark Weisberg, who is now kicking butt and taking names at ClickFunnels in our support department, by the way, um, great mentor. But he did a he did a uh, a team building deal, and it was a spreadsheet in Google Sheets, and you had to build out like this little design. And we picked we picked that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we built him with pixels. Little little pixels, so <laughs> yeah, that was story. Uh, so yeah, was, uh, yeah, so yeah, gross, <laughs> gross versus net, and of course our gold digger, yeah, gold digger. Uh, <laughs> really, funny, really funny one. If you can check it out, uh, I think it's like it's uh, clickfunnels.com, and then or go to like YouTube and just like type in like clickfunnels and like uh, prospector. I think it is or something like that. I think they're looking it up now, maybe. Um, it's it, it's pretty funny. Great advertising. Uh, you know, like there's one of the big things I think a lot of people don't spend enough money on is getting themselves out there, especially if you're, a, mm -hmm. you know, like a cyber, you know, entrepreneur and you don't have a brick and mortar. Uh, even though brick and mortar, I mean, you have to think about location, location, location. But yep. if you're a cyber entrepreneur, you don't have a location. So mm -hmm. you need to really think about the advertising and making things funny. So like, uh, you know, getting getting reach out there. Uh, like today is like, like, what did you say to me kind of thing? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> getting people interested, you know, trying to get stuff in there. Uh, all right, so I carry you through up the link in there. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, check out that link uh, later on. Uh, you'll, you'll get a good laugh of what, what ClickFunnels is. <laughs> Uh, so is, is that with our affiliate link on it, Carrie? No. <laughs> We're not that prepared, but we will be next week. <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> we have so many things on our plate. And uh, one of the big things is, uh, and I would like to say, you know, thank you very much, Misa, for explaining a lot of these terms. I learned stuff today. I, I know I learned stuff today. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. which is going to definitely help us. And, you know, Carrie and I are going to start using a lot of different uh, vocabulary and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm increasing Carrie's vocabulary sometimes. Like, what was our word last week, Carrie? Uh, uh, amalgamate. Amalgamate, that's right. Amalgamate. <laughs> They're like, it's we, not a word. I'm like, yes, it is. It's perfect. Hey, it's perfect for, it's perfect for um, what you're talking about because it's just like – you're grouping everything in a way that makes sense for you to be able to run mm -hmm. your business efficiently. Right. Yes. I don't want to have to think about all these things. I want to be able to look at a report every yes. single week, every single day, every single month, every single mm -hmm. quarter. That's going to tell me how my business is doing. Yeah. Can I even stay in business? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll give it all you should be able to project about 90 days out. 
and know exactly where you're heading. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And that's what we get. Like at we give 110 for us, it's, it's our targets. It's our 90 day mm -hmm. targets. And then it's reverse engineering and coming back from that and building our drives that are going to get us there. Right. Mm -hmm. These are these little micro steps that we take to get us to that end result. Exactly. And to, to, to me, it's just like everything you talked about today was leading up to like, in order to run a successful business, you mm -hmm. need to focus on these eight steps that are going to put you in a great shape to be successful. Right. Exactly. Get that off of your plate. So I don't have to think about it so exactly. much as and react to it but be proactive and like mm -hmm. find other ways that you can improve your systems. Like Rob was talking about earlier and the processes that manage that yep. because we, like prime example, going back to click funnels, it's just like when you're working in an organization and your job is to make sure that you're building the, the, the systems and the tools that are going to, that are going to mm -hmm. help people be successful. It's just like, you got to look at the data and you got to ask yep. questions. Yep. So it's uh this was an awesome uh, awesome awesome uh, episode. Uh, like we're going to be able to go back through this and get some really good micro nuggets, and I think we're going to be able to promote some of that stuff on your social media. And uh, I know we're still live, but if you haven't already, go to Perfectly Kept <laughs> Books. Uh, Misa, like you're so creative. I love your content <laughs> that you're doing on Instagram. It's, look. It's engaging me. I'm like, oh, she's looking up and she's doing all these little things. You're on fire, girl. You're on Thank fire. You. Yep. So if you haven't noticed, you, you're going to notice now. Um, she's awesome. She knows what she's talking about. Uh, she's great. She is, she, she is a, a mother. She is a wife. She, she, she serves. She, she loves the people that she works with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Get over to Perfectly Kept Books. Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so once again, thank you, Misa. And we're going to have you back next week. Uh, do you have your topic? You're going to tease people with what the topic is or we're going to let them know? Or I'm going to talk about keeping your business and personal separate because oh, this one. one is another one where – yeah, we have to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of like. This. Have a credit card, yo, boy. No, no. <laughs> that that one, I, I might need to bring my wife because <laughs> that one's gonna be a touchy subject for me. <laughs> You gonna bring your wife to it, or are you gonna, or are you gonna like block your wife from seeing it? <laughs> right, uh, I, it could be either one. <laughs> Shame on me. Shame so on thank me. you, yeah. So thank you, everybody. We're gonna leave it on that nice little high note there. So yeah, we're gonna be talking about keeping your business separate, your financials separate from personal and business, mm -hmm. of course. And uh, you know, thanks again, Misa. So now I have what? Well, so Misa is the the mistress of mathematics and the Vcaltes of bookkeeping vocabulary. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for being here. So once again, go out to We Give One Ten. You're going to be able to pick up our personal success journal there. You can go through that, and then you can also reach out to us at any of our Facebook pages or Carrie's page or my own, my own personal page, of course. Uh, you can also catch us on YouTube. At we give 110 including instagram we give 110 rob uh we give 110 uh dash rob paisley at uh on instagram as well uh you're gonna see some of my uh you're gonna be posting up a whole bunch of stuff about uh revenue type things as well so um uh, that's gonna be my project uh as a part of my vacation next week uh, i'd never stop working i can't i don't know why <laughs> But uh, yeah, and then of course, if you have any questions about vocabulary on bookkeeping, or if, bookkeeping <laughs> or if you need help with math, hey, hit up Misa at perfectlykeptbooks.com, mm -hmm. and we're going to see you guys all next week. Wait, yes. before you go, Rob, I want to put out a special offer, and it just popped in, in, into my mind, and I want to throw this out for anybody on the line that watches this and reaches out to Perfectly Kept Books with Misa, 
I will gift you five hours of my time and Rob's time for us to hot seat your business, for us to look at your marketing, your sales, your operations, your finance, and we will we we will help you bridge some of those gaps. So if you're out there and you're listening to this and you reach out, this is an offer of coming straight from We Give 110. We want to serve your business. So go ahead and get over to perfectlykeptbooks.com and do that. Give me so your email and let her know that we sent you guys over there. Okay? Yeah. Yes, thank All you. Right. <laughs> Great. So everyone have a good week and we'll see you next week. Uh, I I will be here. I'm going to try to make sure, but I can't guarantee because I'm going to be on vacation. So uh, I don't know what my plan is. First vacation in 15 years that I'm actually being paid. He will not be here. Uh, I've already told him. It's just like I'm working with Rob at work, too, and outside of work. And it's just like, no, dude, unplug, man. It's your vacation. Unplug. I got a pout. <laughs> I'm just gonna block him. It's just like me and Mushika are gonna be in the we're gonna be working in our Google Meet and he's gonna try to join. Nope, get out. <laughs> get out, go on vacation. <laughs> All right. So have a good week, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh enjoy the nice weather while it's there. Sorry, Canada, you got snow again. <laughs> it's Canada. That's what we expect. It is cold. It is it is almost May and it's like in the forties down here in Texas. It's weird. It's weird. This whole year has been weird weather wise. You know, like like mm -hmm. I said that like last week or you know, like with Sean there was like alligators poking their head through the ice. I mean like <laughs> <what? laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me, but you know, we're happy that a lot of people are safe and uh, you know please take care. The virus is still out there. I know mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't want to wear a mask, that's your choice. But, um, you know, think about the people around you um, that, you know, you should try to just try to be a good person. Yes. Stuff like that. <laughs> 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 All right. So have a good week, everybody. Bye.